Hello, I'm Justin Perkins. This is Talk Junkie. Um, I mean, we do everything on this show from, you know, movies to I've never shied away from really talking about much of anything as long as it interests me. And in the middle of this whole no news cycle thing, which uh, is more annoying than I thought because people are all of a sudden want to ask me about things that normally they wouldn't ask me about. Now all of a sudden they want my opinion on it, and there's a couple there's a couple of stories out there like um, the, the mail in ballots that are very interesting to me, but I can't investigate that right now or look into that right now because that's something I was doing and I'm going to do a podcast about it afterwards. Regardless of the the podcast, you know it, it, I like those fun little things you can do those little self experiments. So today. I'm going to talk about Harry S. Truman, the 33rd President of the United States of America. I've been obsessed with a little history kick here as of late, and and Truman is something that popped up that that I was fairly um, interested in, and and I'm going to I'm going to tell you why. Um, when I was younger. Um, there were quite a few people who, looking back now and doing the math, were very, very young during Truman's time in office, but, excuse me, but they spoke very highly of Truman. And Truman is a gentleman that, um, if you look at the history that isn't always in the history books. To me, I don't understand that. But I did. My grandfather always had a lot of questions about Hoover and a lot of things. I'm not Hoover. I'm sorry about Truman. That um, he was never so sure about. And uh, I remember reading a book one time about uh, Truman when I was in grade school. I got it from the library, and it spoke about what a, a great president Truman was. I got it from school library at Car Creek Elementary. I read that book, and, and, and you know, I would ask my grandpa stuff, and he would tell me what he knew, but I could still see he, he didn't have the same feeling about Truman. If anything, it would be safe to say in a lot of ways, he felt very differently about Truman uh, than Truman was portrayed in this book. So a couple of years go by, I'm probably in eighth grade, and, and Find an alternative history back then was hard, but I did find a book, and I don't remember what the book was, but it alluded to some issues with with, Tr- with Truman and, and things of that nature. Later on, it became much easier, like now, to, to find out information on presidents, and I found out a lot of alternative information on Truman that I, I didn't particularly care for myself. Uh, and, and it's always fascinated me, because as Americans, that's something we have a tendency to do. We have a tendency to to glorify and lift up sometimes people who uh, who didn't do the best of jobs. Um, Truman was born May eighth, eighteen eighty four, and he died December twenty sixth of nineteen seventy two. So he came and went years before I was born. Um, the S in, in Truman doesn't actually stand for anything. It's not like William Jefferson Clinton or uh, Barack Hussein Obama or uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, there actually is is no meaning. He, he is his middle name is an initial and it's the initial S. The S was in honor of his two grandfathers. Um, one's middle name I believe was Ship, and the other one's uh, his mother's father's first name was Solomon I believe. But um, so. Harry S. Truman was simply just Harry S. Truman. Um, he served as vice president, and that I want to get to in depth here in a little bit, but he served as vice president um, under Roosevelt. Um, someone who I've always widely viewed as being a really good president, especially his social views and his anti-imperialism stance. I, I've always been a a... a, a big fan of. I mean, he did wrong. They all do wrong. But he is a guy that I can get behind some stuff he did. Um, but he served uh, 
for for Roosevelt and and would have been there going into Roosevelt's fourth term if that had ever happened. Uh, but uh, his presidential term technically begins April twelfth, nineteen forty five. Uh, and he's in office until through his term uh, and comes out on January 20th of 1953. Um, there was a, an assassination attempt on, on Truman. Uh, that's new information. I actually learned this time. It's not something I knew before. Uh, November 1st of 1950, uh, two Puerto Rican pro-independence activists uh, attempted an assassination attempt he was in Washington, but not in the White House. He was staying in a different home while the White House was being remodeled, I believe. Uh, there was actually an officer and one of the um, one of the uh, attempted assassins were killed in in uh, in the the attempt on on President Truman's life. The the real question about Truman, though, and the real thing about Truman is how Truman got into office, how Truman became president. That's not uh, an unlikely uh, path for Truman if we go back um, prior to uh, 1945. If we look at um, the Democratic National Convention uh, for that year, you know, Roosevelt had to be balloted as well, and uh, he come out with it. 1,086 votes to uh, Harry Bird's 89. Um, I think James James Farley James Fra- James Farley he received one vote. So that was a landslide. But coming into this, Roosevelt's health was failing. And I don't think there was a lot of confidence in Roosevelt surviving to be completely honest with you, um, and, and, and making his way uh, through that next term. Henry Wallace was Roosevelt's vice president. He had been Roosevelt's vice president um, in, the, in, in the, the previous term, a very successful term. But the Democratic National Party was very concerned about um, Roosevelt not making it. Um, and, and Roosevelt's biographer, Robert Farrell, said that uh, Truman, I'm sorry, Truman's uh, biographer, Robert Farrell said that Truman getting the nomination of vice president was, quote, one of the great political stories of the century. And it's it's one of those things, it's in, it's in how you look at it, to how great the story is, or how bad the story is. Um, Wallace was an obvious choice. to. I mean, they were the winning ticket. They were the winning team. Uh, Roosevelt stuck with Wallace to a certain degree and then basically backed off and said, you know, I'll let the party do what the party wants to do because he felt, I think, overwhelmed. And that's not defending Roosevelt for that. Roosevelt should have, should have stood up uh, uh, against against the party in in that attempt uh, the the party really just openly and verbally um considered um Wallace unreliable and quote eccentric in general but that was due to quote their dislike of his liberal politics uh Wallace was a very very liberal politician for his time um and then that's that's hard to do you know uh, and, and you take to the the opposite of that, you you've got Truman who openly uh, used slurs against African Americans, which everyone in office probably did at that time. But uh, he was very open about it and very blatant. But his dislike for the Chinese and, and the slang and, and 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 racism he held towards Chinese was, or Japanese, I'm sorry, in, and Chinese in a lot of ways was unparalleled. I mean. Um, Truman was not a great guy in those regards. But the party, even though Truman had no experience, actually was very inexperienced, uh, somehow became their go-to guy. I've read many different theories on why. 
one being that he was a lot easier to control and a lot more in line with party uh with, with party towing the party line at that time and and their ideals were were on the same page um but in order to get that vice presidency he had to be voted in uh, at the convention and, and he ran against quite a few people actually one being Albin Barkley of Kentucky um but that, there were there were a lot of people uh there's maybe a senator from Tennessee um obviously Henry Wallace um Bankhead may have been the gentleman John Bankhead from Georgia or Alabama, but he had he had a lot of a lot of different uh, people uh, vying for that same spot because it had become apparent that the party really didn't have any confidence in Wallace as a party. But the people pretty well had spoken. I, I mean, um, Wallace was the popular candidate. And, and the convention delegates favored him coming into it. Um, you know, at, reportedly at the beginning of the, the convention, or before the, the, the convention actually started, uh, Wallace had more than half the votes necessary to, re, to secure his nomination. So, and at that point, there was a Gallup poll ran, and I'm not much on Gallup polls, but... Just just from the notes, I'll give you this. The Gallup Post said that 2% of those surveyed wanted the Senator Truman to become the vice president. A very, really uh, inexperienced man all the way around, which we, we're constantly putting idiots in office. That's beside the point. But Wallace had done the job and done it well and seemed to be fairly well liked. Um, the Democratic Party, however, didn't really care about this. They they wanted to influence the, the delegates in any way possible. Um, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be super knowledgeable on this process. There's a first ballot, uh, a second ballot before shifts, and a second ballot after shifts. On this first ballot, um, Harry Truman received 319 and one half ballots. Henry Wallace received 429 and one half. So that's delegates putting, delegates putting their, um, their votes forward, uh, which gave Wallace the win. Uh, to be honest with you, it took a lot of, uh, openly, they, they've said this, it took a lot of posturing and positioning to get, uh, uh, Truman to the 319. Um, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy whatsoever. Um, they done a second ballot, and they say this was before shifts, and I, I I believe that's a change in the people who's allowed in. Uh, in the second ballot before the shifts, they did manage to get Truman up to four hundred seventy seven. And in Wallace down to 473, but again, still very close. And and really, this would have been end of the deal sealed because my understanding is, I don't know exactly how the shift works, how people are changed, but this was reported widely uh, by the newspapers. It's been openly talked about since then by uh, other candidates and. Uh, by the police department, uh, I believe the the convention was in Chicago, and they had already turned the labor bosses over into favor. Uh, a lot of these people had got behind Truman. Um, the police actually detained and kept out a huge number, uh, a, a, a vast majority number of people who were Wallace supporters. And, and even with that, all accounts say that Wallace's name was screamed, you know, through that that process that, 
that it still felt like a sure thing. But in that time in between these shifts, however the shifts happened, uh, the party had, had actually been able to, in whatever way, and, and very openly, um, many members of the party said there were a lot of postmaster and uh, various government positions offered and given away that night in order to get Truman in. To get Truman into office required bribery and cheating by his own party just to get him into the vice presidency. Now, as much as I've bragged on, on Roosevelt over the years, you know, Roosevelt sat by idly and watched this happen. I mean, he, he knew what was happening and and, and it never spoke out about it. Uh, he said some things, uh, you know, privately and, and even once, you know, had said basically, I wish we'd went false because throughout the vice presidency, I think that Roosevelt only took the time. And you got to understand, it was a short time. Roosevelt was sick. He didn't live long. But through the vice presidency, um, I believe that Roosevelt and Truman only spoke twice. I want to. I want to say was was the information I was given, and, and Truman was very very um, ill prepared to to take the reins when he took the reins, and and that's. That's something that's widely overlooked at times is he wasn't really in the loop on a lot of stuff because I, I personally it seems to me like from, from the various things, especially accounts you read from Roosevelt biographers and things like that, that Roosevelt just really didn't have any interest uh, or a whole lot of uh, trust in, in, in Truman and didn't seem to care much for Truman's politics. Um, and, and, and that to me, should kind of cast a little bit of light on onto the type of president that Truman ended up being. Most biographers, when they talk about Truman, always bring up the, the thick glasses and the not being able to play sports and the little man complex being denied uh, entry into uh, West Point. He did, however, join uh, the National Guard and, and was in battle. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and he was promoted fairly quickly. He he did well, and and, and was a military man, uh, but was very self conscious and and became in a lot of ways a bully uh, because I think he had been bullied. Um, but once becoming president, um, he 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 went through a a, a long uh, hard finish to to World War Two. He he and McCarthy very much um, get lumped together uh, from the Korean War to, to corruption within his cabinet uh, to the Red Scare with McCarthy. Uh, the, those, those things kind of plagued his presidency. And at the time of coming out of office, it's a very... Why it was a very widely held feeling that he wasn't a very good president, uh, and, and really very little positive about him. Uh, time has a way of of softening the edges and painting a different picture, and that that's one of the dangers in history. Uh, one of the reasons why there's a lot of statues not standing right now in a lot of different places because sometimes we can use history as a weapon, and, and we can be dishonest about history, and we can make people heroes that really were traitors, that, uh, you know, we, we we can build monuments to losers who stood against their own country, and people accept it as history. And, and, and we live in a world now where that's harder to do, but at the time of leaving office, especially with the Red Scare and, and, and the Korean War and, and just the rampant corruption in, in his administration, uh, Truman was not very highly held. Um, now, going into uh, more modern times, he become known as an everyman, a salt of the earth, hardworking, middle class type guy, and that may be very well be true, especially out of office. But the things he did in office, um, th- they deserve to be looked at. And I've mentioned this on a couple podcasts because I was always amazed at hearing this. Um, you know, when we were at war with Japan, 
we were putting Japanese in concentration camps here in America, uh, Japanese Americans, uh, just like the Nazis were putting Jewish people in concentration camps. Obviously, we were treating them much better. Obviously. Um, We had every opportunity to end the war with Japan with a surrender and not have to drop the bombs. That was... That has become well known. The generals and 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 people of uh, involved with Truman's administration and involved with that war have been open over the years since that. That very plainly, we could have exited that war without dropping those bombs. We just had to allow the emperor to be some sort of puppet, and and, and that's. What we ended up doing in most countries we ever took over anyway or went to war with is put in some type of puppet um, government that fails nine times out of ten. Actually, probably ten times out of ten. I don't know where it's ever worked. Uh, But, you know, I think the bully aspect of Truman and the desire to show the Russians that we had this power and capability, which which he arrogantly said no one else will ever obtain... um, that led to to us needlessly dropping not one but two bombs. Uh, and to be honest with you, those bombs didn't really defeat the Japanese and scare them out as much as Russia coming in and helping us and coming into Manchuria and, and up into China and helping us really, I think, pushed the, the Japanese out of the war. They 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 didn't want to uh, they didn't want to be engaged with us and Russia at the same time, and, and you really can't blame them, or the Soviet Union at the time. Now, one of the things that <clears throat> Truman always got a lot of credit for in, in almost any literature I read was basically challenging uh, the Russians and putting them in their place and and, and, and helping to uh, build up our defenses against the Russians. But... If you really go back and look, especially against well-documented things, uh, Roosevelt, although he may have fell short on some promises with the Russians, Roosevelt had a pretty fair and pretty um, good position with the Russians. And I don't believe that uh, Stalin in any way would have made challenges against us, at least at that time. I don't think if if you were able to have Roosevelt finish out that war, I think two things happen. One, you don't drop those bombs, and two, uh, we come out with a better relationship with with Moscow and that, that region. Uh, you know, and, and going into World War II, before we got in, uh, you know, we actually didn't declare war on, on Germany. Germany declared war on us, and, and we declared war on Japan. But coming into that war, there there was actual consideration of, here's your two biggest enemies fighting each other, Germany and, and, and uh, Russia, and whoever's losing, let's let's back, either back the other and help them annihilate them and get us down to one enemy, or let's back the losers and let them have a continued war. And in a lot of way in a lot of ways that's what we did. You know, we never opened a European front and we never really pushed in to that European battlefield in any measurable manner in World War Two. We stayed with Japan and 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 we did, you know, kinda of get around some of the areas that Britain did a lot of the same thing. Britain were much more worried about their, their imperialistic uh, stakes in the world and, and the places that they had occupied and, and that was one of Roosevelt's biggest uh, deciding factors on coming into the war was getting uh, England and France to go okay, empire's over you know, take care of your country and let's get out of these places that you've been in for decades and never helped, you, you've actually kept the populations that are poor that viewpoint and that disdain for imperialism is one of the things I've, I always liked about Roosevelt but Truman was always credited with this tough stance on Russia. And hindsight's twenty twenty, and all we can do now is guess, but 
is that the stance we needed against Russia at the time? The, the Red Scare just horribly, you know, changed our, our perception of, of everything. Um, I'm not a fan of communism any way, shape, or form. I don't like anything that takes freedoms and liberties away from anybody. But I'm also of the feeling that the only way a, a communist country or anybody else can change and revolt is if those people who have to live under it do so themselves. You know, we, we've tried to be, uh, to, to make democratic societies throughout the world. And again, it's one of those things that have failed on us almost every time we've done it. Iraq being, in a lot of ways, a prime example of that. We, we destroyed so much more than, than we helped create. And one of these days, they may be a great democracy, but uh, they're a long way from it, and, and they had to pay a huge price to get there. No, no doubt living under Saddam was a miserable uh, and unenviable experience, but it was an experience they kind of had to get their way out of. And, and sometimes our actions do the opposite. You know, um, look at what Iran was before us and the Iran-Contra and all these things. Look at what Iran was in the was it 60s, 70s. And look at what Iran is today. There's not been progress. It's been regression the whole way, uh, you know. So it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous endeavor to to try to influence anyone else. Uh, but we we were far superior, um, especially after the war in our economy, because that's one thing um, that Truman did fairly well. Um, is help rebound the economy. Now, he had backed the New Deal uh, while a senator. Uh, you know, his policies weren't horrible as a senator. Um, it's it's his presidency. You know, him stealing... You cannot blame him stealing the vice president because that's what he did. It's fraud, and he was not the actual person chosen. But he, uh, let's see, um, Robert Farrell. Robert Farrell was his, uh, uh, was a biographer of of Truman. Uh, And and he said, uh, Harry S. Truman, who did not actively seek it. So Truman didn't even want to be vice president. Actually, Truman's wife was very opposed to the politics of Roosevelt and and despised the White House in general. So he had turned it down, to my understanding, documentedly turned it down and and eventually was coerced into taking it. Uh, You know, it's it's an amazing, amazing thing that... I guess one of the things I always disliked him for the most is the fact that I felt like he stole the vice presidency, but... You know, history has weighed that out to say that it was stolen for him, but he didn't actually want it. But it's just policies in office that, um, you know, we we look at, uh, it's easy to to look at things in modern times. You look at, at, play connect the dots with Halliburton, the Bushes in general, the whole lineage, uh, the CIA, and Dick Cheney. In Iraq, play connect the dots there, and you can see corruption from beginning to end. But it's a little easier to see that because I've lived through that, and I was there, and I looked at it, and I went, "Okay, uh, this guy's making a killing off the blood of troops who are in a place they don't need to be in." And it was plain to see that in that instance, you had a vice president who was clearly the leader who was clearly making important financial decisions, not governmental decisions, because most of his policies, uh, the policies during the Bush years, affected their financial benefit uh, more than ours, uh, more than policies to, to help us as a, as a country. But to look this far back, a lot of times history gets whitewashed, and a lot of times you only get to see the good. Uh, I, I would say very few people have ever sought out and read the statements made by many of these generals 
uh, and many of these military leaders in regarding to not dropping the bomb. And, and I, it was something that I didn't know until I was much older that the Japanese were ready and willing to surrender. They just wanted some type of concession made for the emperor so that they could control their people. You know, he's a god to them. And, and as ridiculous as that may sound to us, you know, to them, Christianity sounds ridiculous. To them, uh, the Muslim belief sounds really ridiculous. So, uh, you know, it, it it's... Viewing history from a distance, it, it it can be easier if you seek out all available information. But if your information's limited and it's skewed uh, and it's doctored, then then history sometimes becomes prettier and softer. Uh, with it, almost always does. Even if the information's there, uh, even if you you're not trying to, I think it's easier and, and more convenient and comfortable to remember the good things instead of the bad. Now, with the exception of economy, and, uh, you know, to the contrary, a, a lot of more physically conservative people, and, and even a lot of the Democratic Party, uh, was very upset with his expansion of social services. And, um, you know, he, he, he had a lot of social policies that were good policies that were extremely liberal for the time. And, and not really cared for at all. So, you know, he, he his it seemed like his his policies at home were far better than his foreign policies. But when you look at the history books and you look at the statements, most people adored his foreign policy and, and didn't care much for his his domestic policy. And, and to me, it looks like the opposite. You know, he helped more people get fed, clothed, and taken care of in hard times at home, and he dropped bombs on innocent people away from home. Now, the Korean War, it's it's in in past decades become fairly well clear with released documents, especially, I believe there's some documents released 2010 to 2013, I'm not sure on that, and I didn't think about putting this in there, so I didn't really do the research on it, but um, that we use germ warfare to some degree in in Korea, uh, so you know, I think the lust of having a new weapon after he had showed the shock and awe of the weapon that that uh, he had in in World War Two, um, I think that desire was there, and uh, a lot a lot of people got a lot away with a lot of bad things uh, on, on foreign lands during Truman's presidency, and, and you know again. I do these podcasts about almost anything, and this may not be your cup of tea. I know I'm getting tons of emails right now about some stuff that, and I think maybe people may have misunderstood me. Look, I want to talk about all these things that are going on right now, but the only input I can give you because I'm not taking in outside input is is the stuff that I'm I'm getting from other people. And and I may cut this thing short. I may just do it the, the rest of next week or the rest of this. I don't know because I, I'm missing out on a lot of good topics I know right now. Uh, and I can I tell you right now, I've got, probably got enough for a podcast right now in, 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 in what change I've seen and in, in, in what I've heard uh, in that time off. But, um, you know, I can't speak intelligently about this whole uh, mail-in ballot thing and, and you know... I can say, based on the information I've given, I think it's very similar to what we've seen here with Truman. It is the stealing of an election. The The problem is, what what difference is it going to make, you know, one way or the other? And that's something, you know, I want to say for a completely and separate podcast of its own. You know, and, and there's... Election fraud is something that I really would like to uh, to look at, you know. And fraud on a presidential level, from Nixon to Kennedy, um, you know, we're to the point now where most historians are comfortable saying without a shadow of a doubt that the mob got Kennedy elected. That's a big step. And, and it, you know... If we can get to the point to where we know 
years back that a lot of dead people who are no longer living voted in Ohio. You know, uh, we look at impeachments and, and presidents who really had no business in in office. People, the, the likes of Nixon, hey, the, the the corruption's there, and all these things are there. I think the problem is we put such a distance politically on history. You know, let's look at literally six years ago, because we're almost four years into Trump, and that would be two years before Obama was out. Six years ago, Dick Cheney and George Bush were still the most evil human beings on the face of the earth. You know, now, at this point, it's Obama and Hillary. I I don't even know if Biden knows he was vice president. But if we go back to, to 2008... You know, at the beginning of that election, Bill Clinton was still, you know, everything basically Epstein was, except he got to be president, and, and he was the focus. So our our history is very limited in that regard. You know, um, a lot of people don't have the capacity to believe this, but at the point that you were four years into Clinton. A lot of people thought Reagan was bad, and that trickle down economics was idiotic. A lot, a lot of people felt that way. I know that seems hard to believe because you had him for eight years. You turn around, you get Bush for four. If, in my opinion, Bush had not raised the taxes to get us out of the position that Reaganomics had put us in, he'd had Bush for four more. Um, so our, our aspect in, in, in kind of the way we view history politically is in four-year chunks uh, and, and it's dependent upon uh, right here today it you know at this moment on this day Friday whatever it is uh, the the world's concentration is on Trump Biden and the bad guy for most people, is still Obama. Now, eight years down the road, regardless, Trump's gone. Whether he gets reelected or not, eight years down the road, Obama or Trump's gone. And, and those people will go, I can't believe we made it through Trump. And Trump will be the focus of that. And they will use Trump to justify where they are at that time because that's what people are doing right now. You know, They're using the policies and failings of Obama to justify where they are with Trump. They used the failings of Bush to justify where they were with Obama. And, and that's not a good method for bettering yourself. Uh, it, it's a good way to look back and, and uh, put blame after the fact, blame that you probably should have put in that moment and made a change because if you look, you had eight years of Clinton, you had eight years of Bush, you had eight years of Obama. Uh, I, I believe you'll have eight years of Trump, and then I believe you'll have eight years of the next Democrat, and then I believe you'll have eight years of the next Republican. They may split one here in our four years. Uh, this should have been the year to split one. This should have been the year to easily beat Trump, uh, but I don't believe that the Democrat Party themselves. Uh, want to? I, I don't know if they didn't feel like they had anybody. I, I don't. I don't know. You know, um, if if you're a single mother working more than one job, raising a kid in the state of California, uh, and and you've had truancy issues, or you're a falsely convicted person in the state of California, the fact if you've been a lifelong Democrat, the fact that Camilla Harris may very well be the vice presidential candidate is a slap in your face and disrespectful to you that you know and that the president should be serving under has dementia when the democrats had the best people to offer this time far hands down far and away had the best people of either party to to offer up this time and, and didn't even attempt to get behind those people actually buried one of those people because they went after Camilla Harris your your party failed you and they're they're allowing Trump to win again. 
Uh, I'm not. I'm going to vote third party. Um, but I know I'm getting a lot of emails about stuff going on right now, so maybe we can transition to that. But to, to me, um, I love history, but an episode like this is it, it's kind of like one of those style experiments where you sit down and you go, okay, you know, what do you know about Harry Truman? Because a lot of people I spoke to uh, knew only good about Harry Truman. And, you know, again, this is opinion. You know, what I stated were facts, but that's my opinion. It's how I view it. Maybe I view it through a different lens, you know. I know so many people who I believe deep down inside think Ronald Reagan can walk on water, and I don't see... I see a man involved with Iran-Contra. I see a man involved who started the war on drugs. I see a man who, in my opinion, allowed the CIA to bring crack cocaine into the inner cities. I don't see a hero when I talk about Ronald Reagan. And, and maybe that's me, may, maybe, but I believe that history weighs that out. And with Reagan, it should be easier for most of us to see. But a lot of people voting this time won't know who Reagan is. They won't know what Reagan done. They won't know what Clinton done. They won't know what Cheney done. They won't know what... A lot of African-American voters will not know economically what the climate for African-Americans were under Barack Hussein Obama. They will not understand what our uh, drone bombing program was like under Bush and Obama. And that's sad. The, The... They've not even had to censor history yet because people don't look back. People don't take the time to consider it. So it's not that the the real information isn't out there because when I was younger, a lot of times the real information wasn't out there. We still thought Christopher Columbus was a hero. You know, willing, willing ignorance is one thing. Ignorance because you don't have the ability to educate yourself is another thing. But being willingly stupid... That's unacceptable. You don't have to agree with me, but you have to at least look into things and and kind of try to think for yourself. And I'm wrong all the time. And I misremember things, and and I change my mind on how I feel about things. Um, But Truman's one of those things that's bothered me ever since I was young. So, I don't know. Something I thought I would talk Be sure to send me messages. Let me know if you like these types of episodes. I know it's not as fun as some of the funny episodes. It's not as... Uh, out there are some of the the other episodes, but it's an episode I really wanted to do and I really liked. Um, Books available. It's available at the Red Spotted Newton Hasbro, Kentucky. It's available on Amazon.com. It's called Creating the Perfect Slaves. Uh, Coal Kingdom is still available. Everyone's Different Just Like Me. The children's book is available. The the Boy with Super Hearing is available. Um, Talkjunkie at gmail.com. Send your emails. No, I don't have social media for the show. Stop sending emails. Ask for social media for the show. Quit being lazy and email me or FaceTime me or something. Let's talk. But we don't need to be on social media to do that. That's It's a gimmick. It's a gimmick. We're being gimmicked. Don't, don't fall for it. Uh, don't suck. Don't die. Be good to people.